the museum. Um, I'm very excited to share with you a little bit about Marshall's life and his work. Um, to start off, I'm going to show a brief documentary that we've just premiered this year, and then I'll talk a little bit about Marshall, who he is, um, and what his artwork is, and his legacy. Span nearly seven decades, Marshall Fredericks created monuments to people, to ideas, and to humanity. He was a public artist. Many of his works are intended for public spaces, to bring people together for a moment of contemplation, remembrance, beauty, or joy. Marshall Maynard Fredericks was born in 1908 and spent his earliest years in the Scandinavian community of Rock Island, Illinois, on the banks of the Mississippi River. The youngest of four children, he showed a creative spark at an early age, carving blocks of soap and later working with natural clay and soft wood. Fredericks' father, Frank Arthur Fredericks, briefly moved the family to Florida before settling in Cleveland to work as a construction engineer. As a teenager, Fredericks would sometimes join his father on work sites, learning about construction techniques and building materials, skills that he would one day use for his own monumental creations. Fredericks attended the Cleveland School of Art, where he gravitated towards sculpture. He kept a scrapbook with articles and photos about famous sculptors, and it was soon filled with the work of Swedish artist Carl Millis. Fredericks excelled in art school and earned a scholarship to fund additional studies in Europe. He could have attended any art school, but the decision for him was a simple one. He wanted to study with the sculptor who had inspired him, Carl Millis. Within a week of his graduation, Fredericks boarded a ship for Scandinavia on his way to the Royal Academy in Stockholm. When he arrived in Stockholm, Fredericks was surprised to learn that Millis had left the Royal Academy five years earlier to focus all of his attention on creating art. Fredericks was able to get in touch with Millis, who invited the disappointed American to his home studio. Fredericks was awestruck to finally see Millis in his studio. Millis appreciated Fredericks' talent and enthusiasm and offered him a position as a stone carver in his studio. After working with Millis for some time, Fredericks decided to resume his travels. He made his way through Europe, enjoying museums and public art. After studying in Munich and Paris, he returned to the United States just as it was plunging into the Great Depression and where there were few opportunities for work, especially for artists. Like many Americans, Fredericks tried to eke out a living, doing odd jobs wherever he could find them, but was soon surprised with an offer from his Swedish mentor Millis had relocated to the United States to work at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, a school founded by George Booth, the owner of Booth Newspapers. Millis was to be an art instructor and artist in residence at the school, and he needed help. It was a remarkable opportunity, and Fredericks jumped at the chance to work alongside Millis. Starting in 1932, Fredericks assisted Millis at Cranbrook, but also began to teach and create his own works which can still be found throughout the Bloomfield Hills campus. Four years after arriving at Cranbrook, Frederick's career path changed nearly overnight. He entered a national design competition for the Levi Barber Memorial on Detroit's Belle Isle Park. With the Great Depression still looming, commissions for artists were scarce, and the competition attracted artists from around the country. The award and commission went to the little-known instructor from Cranbrook for his striking fountain design of a leaping gazelle.
more commissions followed. His light-hearted fountain design of baboons was selected for the 1939 World's Fair, bringing him even greater exposure. His reputation was growing, and so was his success. But the outbreak of World War II put his plans on hold. Within days of the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, Fredericks volunteered for the Army, even though he was too old to be drafted. As he prepared for deployment, Fredericks met Rosalind Bell Cook on an Army base in Arizona where she was volunteering as a driver. The two were married before he left the country, and she delivered twin boys while he was stationed in India, Christopher and Carl, in honor of his longtime mentor and friend, Carl Millis. Frederick served with the 20th Bombing Squad in the India-Burma Theater and rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, serving honorably, but struggling to reconcile his religious and humanist beliefs with the violent conflict. Frederick's return to a country that was both grieving its losses and rebuilding itself. The public was looking for ways to honor the memory of those who had served. Fredericks was himself deeply affected by the war and in search of ways to apply his talents to help the world heal. Before he even returned home, Fredericks was offered a commission to create a war memorial in downtown Cleveland. It was the first of many war memorial commissions. Because of its scale and complexity, it would take 19 years to complete. Fredericks poured his soul into the Cleveland Monument, and the design went through numerous revisions before settling on its now iconic form, which shows the human spirit rising above the flames of war and destruction and toward eternal life. Fredericks hoped the work would bring peace to the many who lost loved ones in the war. Four 10-ton granite blocks depict legends and mythologies from cultures around the world, Nordic, Eastern, Southern, and Western. From each culture, he included symbols reflecting eternal life, an everlasting spirit, and a higher power. In the center, a figure soars 43 feet above the granite basin, rising above a filigreed bronze sphere representing the universe. It was dedicated on Memorial Day in 1964. Even before the war, Fredericks had started to capture the attention of architects. In Fredericks, they saw a partner who could bring artistic vision, enhancing their designs and creating iconic spaces. In his first collaboration in 1939, he partnered with Harley Ellington and Day on the Horace H. Rackham Educational Memorial in Detroit. He went on to work with leading architects, including Alden B. Dow, and established a reputation as a public artist. Nearly 20 years later, he was once again approached by Harley Ellington and Day to create a new work at the center of Detroit, the new Detroit City County Building at the heart of Detroit Civic Center. It would become one of the most celebrated architectural collaborations of his career. Frederick set out to create a symbol that captured the essence of the booming city, once again experimenting with many visual ideas. The final idea includes a central figure that is five times larger than life, representing the city itself. In one hand, it holds a gilt bronze sphere representing the creator, and in the other hand, a family, which Frederick saw as the fundamental building block of society. Cast in Norway, the statue was shipped through the St. Lawrence Seaway and dedicated in a ceremony on September 23, 1958, that attracted thousands. The monument has become a beloved icon of the city and a focal point for civic pride. Frederick's monumental works often reflected his faith. So when he was approached by Father Charles Brophy, a priest at the Indian River Shrine, to create a crucifix for the new chapel designed by Alden B. Dow, he jumped at the opportunity. As he visited the wooded site in Indian River, Michigan, 
he felt that a figure of Christ at human scale would be overlooked when set against a backdrop of towering pines. So he suggested something much larger. As Frederick set to work designing the sculpture, he had ideas about how to depict the Christ figure, which was traditionally shown in great suffering. Frederick's depicted a more peaceful figure with a calm face, no wound in his side or crown of thorns. Legend has it that the design sparked a theological discussion that went all the way to the Vatican. Citing examples of non-suffering Christ figures from the Middle Ages, they approved the design. Fredericks worked from a studio in New York, where he had more space. The casting was done in Norway and shipped almost in one piece, though the arms were welded to the torso during installation in August of 1959. For decades, the cross in the woods has been a serene place for contemplation and meditation. Fredericks was prolific. Working six days a week, he produced thousands of works of art, which can be found around the world in parks and gardens, government embassies and royal palaces, museums and zoos, universities, hospitals, businesses, and libraries. It was challenging work, physically and mentally, but Fredericks continued to create a wide range of works, from small medallions to large monuments, with subject matter ranging from whimsical to spiritual to commemorative. Frederick's work as an artist brought notoriety around the world, from American mayors, governors, and presidents to European kings and queens. Frederick's was knighted in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and served as Royal Danish Consul in Michigan for three decades. When he wasn't in his studio, he was often participating in philanthropic efforts, he partnered with the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen to create an exchange program for young adults with disabilities in the U.S. and Denmark, which included providing trained leader dogs for blind people in Denmark. By the mid-1980s, Fredericks had amassed a huge collection of plaster molds, drawings, photographs, tools, and memorabilia. A former Kingswood School student at Cranbrook, Dorothy Doan Arbery, better known as Honey, led the effort to create a permanent home for Frederick's work. As a member of the Board of Control at Saginaw Valley College, now known as Saginaw Valley State University, she built enthusiastic support to make the gallery a reality. The original building, reminiscent of the designs of Alil Saarinen at Cranbrook, was dedicated in 1988. Following Frederick's death in 1998, the museum was expanded to make room for the sculpture studio, archives, temporary exhibition galleries, and a classroom. And in 2014, the Joanne and Donald Peterson Sculpture Garden was added. Even in his 80s, Fredericks remained prolific, seeing ideas through to completion that he had envisioned decades earlier. At age 87, he was asked to finish a piece that was originated by Carl Millis, but never completed. Close friends urged Fredericks not to accept the commission but Fredericks was driven by love and respect for his longtime mentor and friend. In a return to the city where his career had started decades earlier, Fredericks helped complete the iconic fountain God on the Rainbow, which now greets travelers in Stockholm Harbor. Fredericks completed his final work, 
Lord Byron, at age 90. It was a piece he had designed 60 years earlier. Three days after completing the work, he passed away. There are several things concerning sculpture that I believe are extremely important. It must be wholly consistent and in harmony with the architecture involved, as well as being a beautiful entity within itself. It must embody a significance suitable to and expressive of the purpose and setting. And finally, it must have a constructive meaning for others. I love people, for I've learned through many experiences, both happy and sad, how beautiful and wonderful they can be. Therefore, I want more than anything in the world to do sculpture which will have real meaning for other people, many people, and might in some way encourage, inspire, or give them happiness. Um, this work has a very long history. 
Um, it was an idea that was originally conceived of for the Cleveland War Memorial. Um, so the idea dates back to that 1940s time period. So I'd like to show you a few of the original ske sketches for that project. Um, you can, you'll notice the familiar female and male figure um, that we all know and love here in Royal Oak. Oh, this is a little dark lighting, but um, he, Marshall said about this project, it, it was, I was in uniform, I had to do it because it was something that was in my mind. So this was an idea that he had in his mind while he was serving. Um, he, when he came back from the war, it was very important to him to honor the men that he had served with while abroad. Uh, and he did several different uh, war memorials throughout Michigan and throughout the country. Um, so this is the presentation drawing for Cleveland. Uh, as you can see, the base is different. So in, in this idea, there it was a sphere, a very intricately, intricately carved sphere. Um, and here again, Frederick's working on the project in the mid-1940s. And this is the study for the Cleveland War Memorial. So this is a small scale, again, the two figures. Um, and then finally, here is what the end product was. So as you heard in the documentary, it was a project that took him 19 years to complete. Um, the final design was the male figure minus the female figure um, with flames covering the uh, lower half of the sculpture. Um, and then during an interview in the 1990s, uh, Frederick talked about um, why, why the idea changed in Cleveland. And in, the, in that um, interview, he said it was because of cost. That's not really true. Um, <laughs> it was actually the Gold Star Mothers, who were a group of um, women whose sons had passed during the war, they objected to the nudity. So uh, Marshall reconceived his idea and added the flames to make it a little more proper. Uh, so that's really the, the story of why Cleveland uh, looks the way it does and the two figures idea was scrapped. So he, again, this was an idea that was around. He, he liked this idea a lot and really wanted it to be somewhere. So he proposed this idea um, in the 1960s for uh, a project at, for the U.S. State Department. Um, so again, you see your male and female right here. This time, um, it's surrounded by these orbits. So this is at the height of the space race. So he loves this idea. Okay, we'll, we'll make it very cutting edge, and we'll add this space theme to it. Uh, the government did not like it. So. <laughs> This is the final product here. So we've um, got this male figure sitting on a planet. Um, he has stars in his hair. And he's holding different planets in his hands as, as though he could throw them out into space. So um, again, he also proposes the, uh, the same figures as an idea for the spirit of Detroit. So the spirit of Detroit could be very different from, from what we know and love today. So let's talk about this idea for Star Dream. How did that come to be? So. Um, the project began prior to 1985 when then Mayor Barbara Holman, uh, who was a former art teacher, began discussing the possibility of a major art project for the city uh, with Marshall Frederick. So when the plaza for the library was designed at around that time period, there was a large planting bed was, was prepared in anticipation of putting in a future Marshall Frederick sculpture. So, the Star Dream actually has had a few different names in the planning process. It was also known uh, at one time as the Spirit of Man um, and also as Aspiration. Um, so Marshall revived this original concept when Holman approached him about a sculpture to symbolize the spirit of Royal Oak. And so he adapted that original Cleveland design um, by adding this multifaceted stainless steel star base. So it's uh, one large star balanced on top of four smaller stars, and Marshall Fredericks actually used different mathematical formulas so the points of the stars all touch each other in a certain way. <coughs> so this is a presentation drawing for the project. As you can see, it's not to scale, but um, the star dream figures soar and reach out and up in representation of the revitalized spirit of Royal Oak. Um, Marshall Fredericks actually said, quote, it will be to Royal Oak what the spirit of Detroit is to Detroit. But we'll, it will be more exciting because it will be larger with water and won't be detracted by other things around it. 
Um, sadly, there was a setback to the project in 1988 when Barbara Hallman, who had been one of the strongest advocates for the project, passed away. Um, and the city decided to honor her by naming the plaza in which the sculpture sits in her name. So we have Barbara A. Hallman Memorial Plaza today. And here's Frederick's working with a small scale plaster model for the fountain. So despite this loss, the work continued on. Um, we have here some of the project supporters and co committee members meeting with Frederick's in his studio to discuss the project. And then we have here with the fundraising uh, brochure that was handed out, and maybe some of you recognize this from back in the late 80s, early 90s. So this was actually mailed out to all the different residents in Royal Oak for donations. Uh, and quite a few different people were, uh, helped to make this project possible. So from the Downtown Development Authority, about $294,000 were raised. Um, two different grants from the state uh, for $230,000. Um, privately, funds were raised, and about $20,000 was raised just from this brochure. Um, Corvus was a developer of a multi-use project at Woodward at 696, donated $150,000. And then the final push for the final $10,000 um, actually came from the organizers of the Woodward Dream Cruise. Um, so that put them over the top of the fundraising goal, and the project was approximately about $700,000 to complete. Um, and, and as has been mentioned before, Marshall did donate all of his time and his commission on the project. So the, though there was no taxpayer funds used though, so it was all privately raised. Okay. Though the project began in the mid-1980s, the formal contract for it was actually not finalized between Marshall and the city until 1992. Um, so here we can see the plastiline model for Star Dream, the full scale model. That's the clay model um, around the time when that contract was finalized. And again, here's Marshall working on it with his assistant Scott Spokom. We have the male figure and the female figure in clay. And then here we have the plaster model being created. So it's a multi-step process to create a sculpture from the clay. Um, you would create it in a small scale, then you would enlarge it, um, and then you would have to create the plaster molds for the casting of the bronze. So around, uh, in, the late in late 1995, the models were sent to New York where they were cast. And here we have Marshall Fredericks uh, in 1997 inspecting the final brand bronze casting. Um, you can see though, it doesn't have its green patina on it. Um, so what happened is, since it's such a large sculpture, it was 39 feet tall, um, the sculpture had to be cast in sections and then they were welded together and bolted to an internal stainless steel structure. So this is when it was installed. Um, though the, it was dedicated in September, it was actually installed in early June 1997. So we have the figures being hoisted from a flatbed truck using two different cranes. And then, Using one crane, they were able to lift the sculpture to a vertical position and then slide it down, this beam in the center of the base. And then in September, 20 years ago today, uh, the sculpture was dedicated. Um, so Marshall Fredericks was 89 years old, but still working six days a week. Um, he had several different projects that he was working on at the late stages of his career. And over 300 people attended the dedication 20 years ago. So Marshall spoke at the dedication, and he said, quote, it means so much to me to be here because I did not expect to be here. Um, and actually, the weather that day was cloudy, so he commented that it would be nice if the sun came out because I'd like to see the stars of the base sparkle. So he really enjoyed that, the stainless steel stars of the base. Um, and five months after the sculpture was dedicated, it actually had to be removed and shipped back to New York for repair work. Um, there were some tiny holes in the, in the surface of the sculpture, um, and also a hairline crack appeared under the male figure's arm, which extended out from his chest to underneath the arm that supports the female figure. Um, so this, these tiny little holes created a porosity problem, um, so it was no longer waterproof. Um, so of course we needed to get that fixed. Um, and there was also some discoloration that was, being, that was happening because of these problems. So it was absent for four months, 
Uh, unfortunately, though, while it was gone in New York, Marshall passed away. Um, so he passed away in April 1998 before the sculpture was returned. But it was when it was re reinstalled in June of 1998, his wife Rosalind was there for the reinstallation. So Marshall said that this sculpture really symbolizes the spirit of Royal Oak. He said it expresses human aspiration and striving toward greater achievement in all endeavors. He really wanted the sculpture to be a legacy to the community where he had worked for over 50 years. Now, there are several other Marshall Frederick sculptures in Royal Lock, the Loke. Um, one of them is at Beaumont Hospital. It looks a little different today, I think, uh, <laughs> the building. Uh, but on the exterior of the building is this relief called The Family Protected by Healing Herbs, and that is inspired by a verse from Revelation, which is the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Um, this piece is actually in aluminum, and it was awarded the gold medal of sc in sculpture by the Architectural League of New York in 1956. Then there are actually quite a few pieces by Marshall Fredericks at the Detroit Zoo. Uh, the first of which is Mankind and Primates. This was an aluminum relief that was located in the Holden Amphitheater and Great Ape House at the zoo. Um, that structure has since been replaced by the, the new, more open air um, exhibit in the 1980s. And this piece actually has been in storage, but there's been talk about reinstalling it. So hopefully that can happen. And then Marshall also designed all the furniture for the Great Ape House. Um, so he did this kind of space age design here. Um, so from left to right, we have a monkey go round, a double tra trapeze ring, a trapeze pallet, and a climbing tree. So he studied the different um, apes at the zoo for months to determine the needs that they would have. And he selected fiberglass and stainless steel for hygienic reasons. And he, all those, this um, photo is unfortunately in black point. These were all in very bright colors because he thought the apes seemed to like the bright colors. Um, so again, this building has been replaced and the, the furniture is no, lo no longer exists as far as I know. But. So he did all kinds of different things during his career. Then we have um, Leaping Gazelle, which is the piece that was originally done on Belle Isle, but it's also when you come into the zoo on the left-hand side. Um, and then Flying Wild Geese, which is at the Chrysler main station of the Tauber Family Rail Railroad. Um, and that is actually, originally was done for as a memorial at Elmwood Cemetery in Detroit, which that's the original. So we have uh, two bronze geese um, taking off into flight with wild rushes under their wings. Then we have the male and female baboon that sit outside the Wildlife Interpretive Gallery. Uh, these were done originally for the 1939 New York World's Fair. And then flying pterodactyls, which is outside the Holden Museum of Living Reptiles. So quite a few pieces at the zoo by Fredericks. Sometimes people think that the bears were, were done by Fredericks, but those were actually done by Corrado Parducci. So lots of different artworks you can see at the zoo. It's really one of the places to visit. And then we have our pieces here at the Royal Local Library. We have our wonderful lovesick acrobat and juggler clowns. Mouse, um, which is was done as part of the Lion and Mouse at East Glen Center in Harper Woods, if any of you are familiar with that piece. Um, and then Two Bears, which was originally done for a shopping mall in Urbana, Illinois, but large scale versions of that can be found at the Sterling Heights Public Library, um, at Interlochen, and some, several other places. So those are the pieces that are in Royal Oak, but of course, I'm sure you know there are many, many different uh, Marshall Fredericks sculptures located uh, in the Detroit area especially, but also throughout the state. Um, so in case you're interested in learning more about Marshall or maybe visiting some of his works, I left some brochures there by the door. This is a great glove box guide that we have at the museum. So if you're traveling anywhere in the state, you can see where some of the Marshall Fredericks works are. So I encourage you to pick up one of those. Or of course to come visit us at the museum. Um, we're a nice little drive up I-75 in Saginaw. We would love to have you come visit. Um, in addition to Marshall's work and the sculpture garden and the recreation of his studio, we do bring in three to four different temporary exhibitions each year of uh, local and Michigan and international artists as well as humanity exhibitions. 
And I want to thank the City of Royal Oak and the Royal Oak Public, Public Library for, very much for inviting me here today. It's been an honor to speak to you, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned a little bit more about Scar Dream and about my <laughs> First, uh, the sculpture committee, I'm Dave Richards, I was on the sculpture committee. And we were a, a shy group, so we did not get the names when we were asked to stand up earlier. So maybe we could acknowledge Jean Chamberlain, who was one member of the committee by name, and Ann Hoyt, another member, and former mayor and current city commissioner, Pat Karouche. And I also want to comment, it has been emphasized, the part of Barbara Hallman in starting the whole project. And it was a matter of a series of mayors following through and included Barbara Hallman at the start. I, I was also on the city commission from 1983 to 1991. And one of the first things I remember was Barbara Hallman approaching me, talking about this project with this gentleman named Marshall Fredericks. I'd heard the name before, but I re didn't really know anything about him. But following her Mayorship, we still were a long way away. Bob Stocker was the next mayor. He was very supportive. He worked on it. Uh, after that, Pat Grouch as mayor, and Dennis Collin, who we all met earlier. We haven't met many times in the past. And so it was a series of, of mayors, and a series of commissions, and a series of community people. And with respect to the financing, uh, you did point out that uh, Marshall Fredericks received no fee for his work but just the construction of a mammoth piece like that and the process, as you've shown, is very involved. You have to do it one stage at a time, a bigger piece after another, and uh, it's very expensive. And so that's where all the fundraising came in, and that uh, took some time and took some effort and from a variety of different people that uh, came along uh, to get it done. But I have to tell you that one of my favorite memories, and I don't know if this was a city commission meeting, our city commission group or a sculpture group, uh, but you had a picture of a group of people meeting in Marshall Frederick's studio, and I was one of those people. And uh, when I think back of the years I was on the city commission, that is one of my favorite memories because you can see a little bit from the photographs. It's quite an experience to see the various works of art in their stages uh, all around the studio, and they're all mammoths, just about all of them are mammoths. And so that's a memory I'll never forget.